Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to take a look at a very important organization that encompasses a large number of public administrators in the United States and networks with public administrators around the world, the American Society for Public Administration. My guest today is an expert on this organization. Mr. William Bill Shields is the Executive Director for the American Society for Public Administration. He's also an adjunct professor at American University. Bill Shields, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Bill, it's great to be with you and your audience. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate you being with me today, Bill. Let's jump right into it. The American Society for Public Administration, commonly called ASPA. I've been a member for decades now. You're and thank the you. executive director. Uh, what exactly is it? When was it formed? Why was it formed? What is your main mission? So ASPA is, um, is a old organization. We were founded in 1939 uh, in Chicago. And at the time, uh, it had a very distinct mission. And even with the passage of time, even in the succeeding decades and decades and decades, the mission has remained the same. We're the nation's largest and most prominent professional association for public administration. And our unique niche in the field of public service organizations is that we bridge the practitioner communities, those who are actually doing the public service work with the academic communities, those who are doing the research and the teaching and the learning, the students who are doing the learning so that both communities talk to each other and can really fill out and round out uh, their work so that research informs practice and the practitioners actually tell the researchers what kind of information they need to do their jobs more effectively. It's very important to have the practitioners and the academics working together on this because it's, it's, a, it's a process that requires both of their inputs. Well, Bill, that brings up an interesting question. Often uh, people will say, what exactly is public administration? Or how do you define a public administrator? That's, that's the question I get from my parents every time I talk with them about my, about my job. So the way I like to describe a public administrator is um, someone who is dedicated to doing the public good. You know, if you look at a very strict or formal definition of public administrator, you'll often hear those people with those strict definitions say a public administrator is someone who takes public policy and puts it into practice in delivering a particular public program for a constituency or for a citizen or group of citizens. I kind of take it more broadly in terms of the people who both make the policies, because that is public policy for sure, but we're a public service organization. And so our members range from uh, elected officials to city managers, to police officers, to budget analysts, both in the United States and around the world. About 10% of our membership is located uh, outside the United States. So because these people are dedicated to doing the public good, we take a more encompassing definition to say, okay, those who, who certainly are, are implementing the policies that our elected officials have put into place, but also the people who infuse the knowledge to really educate those who are making the policies so that they can make very good decisions. Now, if our viewers would like, and I'm sure many of them will, they can go to your website at www.aspanet.org, and we'll put that down in the lower thirds. Bill, you're, you're, you have a really a multifaceted organization, and one operation within ASPA is the sections. You've got sections on Korea, China, women, minorities. What exactly, briefly, what are the sections? And could you pull out one or two just to give us an example of what that section does? Sure, be happy to. And it's a great question because um, ASPA is a generalist organization. We've prided ourselves in more, for more than 80 years on being that umbrella organization that those dedicated to the public good can join for professional development opportunities, for uh, authorship opportunities, for information exchanges and capacity building opportunities. So we are a very welcoming and encompassing group. So we're a generalist organization. But at the same time, we know that a lot of our members really want to dive into particular aspects of the field of public administration. So we have expertise oriented sections. We have 33 of them within the organization. And you pointed out a few, Bill, 
But what's really interesting is that about 15, 20 years ago, ASPA made a really concerted focus on being thoughtful about our international programming, our international relationships, knowing that the field of public service and public administration really does go beyond geographic boundaries. They know no geographic boundaries. So in order for our members to learn more about a particular aspect of the field, we have these 33 subject matter sections. And several of them have a very distinct uh, international focus. Two of them um, that I would like to highlight for you um, are the section for international and comparative administration mm -hmm. and our newest section, which is the section on African public administration. So what these sections do is it, they provide a forum for their members who are ASPA members and can join the sections voluntarily to have a dedicated space, kind of a trusted community where they can exchange information. So for example, the section for comparative uh, public administration is looking at public administration trends that really go beyond the United States and around the world. So for example, um, SICA is the acronym for the section. It's doing research around COVID and the global response to the COVID epidemic. And so our members of SICA get together and they, uh, through occasional papers, through symposia, through information sharing, learn what other nations are doing in a comparative way. For the section on African public administration, our newest section, that is where our members get together with like-minded organizations, public service organizations in Africa to really focus on capacity building, to use the expertise that we have within our association to really strengthen the work that's taking place on the African continent. So it's very hands-on, practice-oriented. And that too is very, very important. Now you do, you have over 25 memoranda of understanding with a wide range of groups. Uh, we won't go into all of them, but you also interact with United Nations agencies. And you have, uh, as I look at the UN, the UN is just an extension of public administration in the United Absolutely. States or in France or Brazil or wherever it might be. And that they are the people who are carrying out public administration activities at the, at the federal, state and local levels. Uh, one group you have is the Committee of Experts with the UN. What exactly does that do? So the uh, United Nations Committee on Experts in Public Administration uh, is a committee that the United Nations has, uh, has established and I want to say for uh, over two decades. Uh, and it is a forum at the United Nations where this committee comes together once a year and defines an agenda, an agenda of issues that the committee will work on together collectively. And um, the, the membership on the committee is uh, as broad as the United Nations itself in many respects in terms of its coverage across the globe. Um, ASPA, my, my association, is an observer organization to that committee. And coincidentally, uh, not because of ASPA, but coincidentally, uh, members of our leadership are actually on the committee of experts. Uh, so for example, Alan Rosenbaum, who is our past president, but also our president elect, um, most recently served as vice chairperson of the committee on experts. And so the committee gets together, it does work over the course of the year, but it gets together typically in April um, at UN headquarters in April. And what is uh, in New York and what the committee does is really kind of reviews the work that's done in the prior year and reviews the work ahead. And not surprisingly, a lot of the work is focused on the uh, sustainable development goals uh, that the UN has established. What's great for us and for an organization like mine is that having this committee meet every year uh, in New York at the UN gives me the opportunity to interact and interface with uh, my counterparts from our counterpart organizations around the world. So that within that week in New York, I can talk with leaders of international associations based in Africa, based in Korea, based in the Middle East, based in Western and Eastern Europe. So rather than traveling around the world to meet with them to try to forge connections with my organization, that provides a safe space for us to do it in one consolidated period of time. And often when we think about the United Nations, we think of, well, they, they describe themselves as international civil servants, but they're really international public administrators. They're doing Absolutely. up there 
they're providing public security, they're dealing with environmental issues, climate change, combating health problems, helping to move ships, mail, weather information around the world. The same thing that public administrators are doing in our states, in the United States and elsewhere. Well, you're watching Absolutely. Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station or an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a computer, you like our shows, and you would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections is provided at no cost to help people in the United States and around the world better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're taking a look at the role of public administrators and the important role that they play in the US and around the world. My guest today is Mr. Bill Shields, who is the Executive Director of the American Society for Public Administration. Bill, we're talking about the importance of public administrators and they, there's no doubt about it. We could not have public policy carried out without public administrators, <laughs> it just would not work. And of course you have schools of training uh, I guess right now they're probably, I'm guessing about, uh, probably over a hundred uh, schools of public administration around the United States or- uh, Oh, many, many more than that for sure. Yeah. Many more than that probably, yes, right. But anyway, that's so important. But let's talk a little bit about how the United States, we'll just take us as an example since we're in the United States. What is a classic federalism model and how is it supposed to operate? And maybe we could tie it into the COVID-19 uh, operation, many call a, a bungled operation, as to uh, how poorly that went from day one. But uh, what uh, what is the uh, what should a, a typical, normal, logical, reasonable federalism model look like? With the federal government playing a certain role, states playing a certain role, the localities, and tie that into the COVID nineteen distribution and effectiveness or ineffectiveness of how it went. Um, you've teed up a great one, Bill, because we're all living in the moment right now of a situation where federalism both works and, in my opinion, does not work. Um, you know, kind of the romantic definition of, of federalism is this delicate balance that has been struck between the federal government, our national government, and our states. Um, and it is one of the two greatest inventions that our founders uh, created uh, when, when establishing our country, the other being separation of powers. And essentially it, it, it boils down to the notion of the powers that are vested within the national government, our federal government, and those powers that are vested within, within state governments, our 50 state governments. And then as you pointed out, um, down to a local level as well. Um, in terms of models, I, I use one that that I think is is uh, quite relevant, particularly in the uh, in the case of COVID. Um, a very well respected uh, public administration scholar, uh, Don Kettle, who teaches at the University of Texas, um, just came out with a book called "The Divided States of America," and he is looking at federalism over the course of our nation's history. But what he really defines federalism is, is uh, as it's really a balance um, that rests on hazy laws and fuzzy values. And that federalism is not a fixed structure, but it's really a set of rules for combat, combat between the federal national government and the states. And that's what we're seeing right now with COVID because you have a, a situation where there certainly are capacity issues. I mean, we certainly have an unprecedented health crisis. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And we respect everyone who's having to deal with it on the front lines, but it's unprecedented. But at the same time, there's a capacity issue, uh, whether it's testing, whether it's getting the appropriate PPEs at, at, to, the right, uh, to the right areas of the country, to the right localities. But there's also an issue of responsibility. Exactly what is our national government responsible for? And what is it that our state governments are responsible for? Because like, as you pointed out, public administrators are on the front lines and COVID has shown the tremendous work, tremendous work 
that our frontline public administrators do, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's public health, whether it is uh, our teachers in elementary schools, those are all public administrators. And the work that they're doing during this crisis is amazing. Yet the situation that we are confronting is that we have these fuzzy laws and hazy values between the national government and the states. So states don't know what they can rely on the national government to do. And then in many cases, the national government puts its hands up and says, we're not responsible for doing things. We're not responsible for testing. We're not responsible for getting you the PPE, even though history has shown us that that is exactly what a national government is responsible for doing. So a lot of confusion, and that's really reflective of the U.S. experience with COVID. And of course, most of the experts and scientists who have looked at the COVID situation came to the conclusion that it was bungled from day one. We had a president who admitted to Bob Woodward in private that it was an airborne disease, it was terminal, it would kill you, it could kill you, not that it would every time. And then the next day we go out and say, well, don't worry about it, go to work, do live your life, and basically put out just one piece of misinformation after another. But that was typical. When we talk about the development, of the cadre of public administrators and the training, and the United States was always looked upon as sort of a beacon of democracy with well-trained professionals. And we saw the Trump administration basically gutted most of the agencies, did away with scientific evidence, especially in areas of climate change, they politicized the Centers for Disease Control, just basically weakened the United States internally, which it had already done through its foreign policies externally. How does the U.S. rebuild that? And what role can ASPA play in helping to develop a new cadre of public administrators who really need to be well-trained to carry out these very, very, I'm going to say uh, challenging positions and to help strengthen this country and to make this a safer better society as opposed to what's, what it has been for the past few years? Uh, it's a great question and a tremendous challenge for our nation. Um, just some statistics. I mean, the Department of Education um, saw a 15% decline in its workforce over the past four years. Uh, both the Department of State as well as the Department of Labor saw a 12% uh, decrease in its staffing levels. Um, of the 22 independent agencies within the national government, the federal government, uh, 20 of them saw declines or shed employees under the, under the past administration. So, you know, overall, the relative number of federal employees has remained constant over the past 40 years or so. But the reality is, is that we have a situation where a lot of the, um, of the federal service, our civil servants, are aging out. And the concern is, do you have the next generation coming in to replace them? On IT issues, which is probably one of our most critical um, public service issues, you know, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's making sure that social security checks get administered, five times the number of people who work on IT issues in the federal government are over 60 years old. Five times as many as are over 60 than under 30. That's remarkable not in a good way. So the question is, what do organizations like ASPA do to really combat this or deal with it? And it's really to redefine public service. It's to tell the story of public servants and public administrators. That's the first thing, because it's only with crises, whether it's a government shutdown, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a hurricane, do, that Americans really see what public servants do for people in their daily lives. We, don't, we should not have to wait for a crisis in order for Americans to realize that. And so you tell the story, attract the younger generation to come into public service and make, public ser make the case for public service in a compelling and interesting way. That's the other thing too. Rather, how do they contribute to the mission of an organization that serves the public? not just what particular silo are they gonna be working in within a particular department, because that will turn them off right away. So ASPA really promotes public service by demonstrating what the attractiveness is to, for those who might be interested in participating in it. 
it will be quite a rebuilding project, but it can be done, there's no doubt about it. Well, for years, for decades, really, a major plank of US foreign policy has been to promote democracy around the world. The US has been viewed as the beacon on the hill, so to speak, of democracy. We saw January 6, 2021, that basically, I'm not gonna say a myth, but that image was shattered. We saw what happened with the invitation and incitement of a mob of insurgents, uh, terrorists, domestic terrorists, uh, traitors, whatever you want to call them, come to the Capitol and to storm the United States Capitol. This is just something that just reverberated around the world. It was shocking to people in the United States and to the whole world. How, do, how does the public administration community view this as to what happened and what can we do to improve that? Well, I think um, a well-intentioned public administration community would see it as an attack on democracy and an attack on our constitutional values. Uh, because at, you know, the, the, the scenes were horrific. Uh, the loss of life was intolerable. And, um, and, and the work of the perpetrators of the mob um, was abominable. But at the same time, I think it's really important that we boil it down to what we saw on January 6th. And that was an attack on a constitutional process. They were attacked, the mob was attacking something that was taking place that was constitutionally mandated. And that was the certification of the electoral vote for president of the United States. And so for the public administration community, it's remembering that and how serious it is and how fragile our democracy is. But the thing is, Bill, what we saw, why did those people do that? And that really kind of gets to the nub of where we really need to be focusing our attention. What motivated that mob to storm the Capitol? The, the same types of things that, that inspired mobs or large crowds to be protesting in Berlin back in August saying that COVID was fake and lockdowns were bad. The same thing that you saw going on in, uh, in Myanmar uh, with, with, the, with the military takeover. They said the whole election in which the democratically elected um, government was elected, it was a fake election. It was rigged. Does it sound familiar? Did they get that message from someone else? So we have to be really, really thoughtful about where we're getting our information from and being really thoughtful about wh who are the people behind these big lies that are being told because they're not going away. And what we saw on January 6th was a very gross, but very real reflection of what's been going on around the world. And that is exactly the reason it happened because there was a big lie. There was, and it went on really for years and years with, with attacks on the media, attacks on democratic institutions, calling everything fake news. But the big lie was the Donald Trump won the election with there was no proof whatsoever that it was thrown out of court at least 60 plus times that I recall right offhand. And there was absolutely no evidence that the election was rigged. Even Republican secretaries of state and other folks said it was an honest election. It was probably one of the fairest and most honest elections ever in the history of the United States. That's now correct. there are always irregularities and they need to be checked. There's no doubt about that. But this was a big lie and it was propagated by a large number of media outlets, namely Fox, namely One American News, namely Newsmax, which had just pushed out one piece of misinformation slash lie after another. But this is what this country has to reconcile with now. We have to determine how honest are we going to be with ourselves? How are we going to rebuild? How are we going to start looking at really evidence, talk, looking at scientific evidence, looking at what is the truth, as opposed to believing people who are out here just spouting nonsense. And then you throw into the mix the QAnon crowd, which we won't even go into that right now because we don't have time to do it. But Bill, let me ask you in the last 30 seconds, sure. what do you see as the major challenge for the American Society for Public Administration and public administrators as we move forward? I think the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity that we have, Bill, is to um, go back to what I said a few minutes ago, which is don't wait for the crisis to happen uh, to recognize and appreciate and celebrate the work that civil servants, public administrators do. And so for us, it's continuing to tell that story. 
and telling that story brings great minds into public service, great new, fresh, young minds into public service, but also allows our citizenry to get the information they need to make educated decisions and to appreciate the work um, that millions of people do, because there are millions of people in public service, what they do to serve them and to serve their society effectively and equitably. It certainly is our major task right now. But Bill Shields, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Bill, it was a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.